So uh, the book of Revelation is written by John, and uh, he has been exiled uh, to Patmos when he got this vision. The vision came from God the Father, was passed on to Jesus Christ. Jesus gave it to his angels, and it was delivered to John the Apostle. Now, John had lived a full life. He was almost uh, 90 plus at the time of writing this book, is what historians estimate. And uh, he has uh, suffered a lot of persecution. And at the time of John's writing, persecution had broken out against the Christians uh, in the church. And uh, the rulers, especially the Roman Empire, was uh, had turned all its focus on persecuting the Christians during that time. So people uh, had uh, uh, were losing their faith. People were losing their confidence in uh, following the gospel. And they had uh, uh, they were being challenged in their faith every day. And to encourage them, John wrote this book. Okay? The, the message, the main theme of the book is the return of Christ, how he is going to return and how he's going to judge the world system and how the children of God would be safe and he would take them eternally with him. Okay? So it follows uh, the main key verse that you could find in Revelation is found in chapter 1, verse 19 where Jesus tells John, write therefore the things that you have seen, those that are and those uh, that are to take place after this. Write therefore the things that you have seen, those that are and those that are to take place after this. So the Bible uh, uh, itself is suggesting that Revelation, the book of Revelation can be divided into three segments. Things that you have seen in the past tense, that are, that is being happening right now, and there are to take place after this in the future. Okay, So these three stages are being recorded by John. Chapter 1 is actually what things you have seen. Chapter 2 to chapter 4 is those that are happening right now. And those that are to take place after this is from chapter 4 to the end of the book. Okay, So this book can be divided into three segments. Chapter 1 is one segment. Chapter 2 to 4 is the next segment, and chapter 4 onwards, that is after four, 5, 6 onwards, uh, all the way to the end of the book, is part 3 of Revelation. Okay, So what do you see in Revelation chapter 1? Jesus gives John a glimpse of himself, how the high priestly Jesus is right now. He is not the man whom John was holding hands with when he was walking here in, uh, in Israel. You know, he is a uh, glorified Jesus that uh, we are going to see now, and his appearance does not look like a bearded shepherd from the 2000, you know, uh, first century. He actually looks like uh, uh, a glorious figure where his appearance uh, caused John to fall prostrate and worship him. Okay, So this is the Jesus that John saw and uh, all the radiance that comes with it, and John was so ex ex um, you know, excited seeing the whole thing, and he wrote it down. And this writing is what you have seen. Secondly, we are going to see Jesus as he is right now, like this only. Okay? So this is the appearance that with which we are going to see Jesus. And it talks a lot about his character. It talks a lot about his power. And it also talks about John's helplessness uh, in, as, as he falls down to worship Jesus. Chapter 2 to chapter 4, there is a series of letters written to the churches. And these are the churches that you would find even today in the world. And Jesus analyzes them. He sees through their hearts, sees their thoughts, he sees their attitudes, and then he judges them based on that. Some churches are approved for the good things that they have done. Some churches are reprimanded for the wrong that they're doing, for the sin that they're committing, and they're exhorted to come back to their old faith. They're exhorted to come back into a steady walk with Christ, to become an overcomer. Okay? So each of these letters actually highlight the churches that are existing, during the first century, and even now. Many of these churches, group of believers, can identify themselves with these churches. Now, what is the exhortation? Exhortation is to come back and walk with Jesus because he understands what we are going through, and there is room for repentance and for the church to come back to its first love and keep on walking with him. Okay, this is the main theme of the chapter 2 and chapter 3. In chapter 4, we see the rapture. The rapture happens and the church is raptured, which means taken out of this world. 
And as John sees it from then on, from heaven's perspective, the church also is now seated in the heavenlies and seeing what is happening. Okay, so from chapter four onwards, the church has been raptured, which means taken out of the world, and the church sees everything from heaven's perspective. The body of believers that are existing in the world right now will be raptured, which means no believer will remain here. I'm not talking about nominal Christians. I'm not talking about uh, Christianity in general. I'm talking only about believers. Those who have committed their hearts to Christ and received Jesus as their personal savior will be raptured and they will be having a different perspective from chapter four onwards. Once they're raptured, they see things through the eyes of heaven. And at that time, the beginning of the birth pains, chapter six onwards, the beginning of the birth pain starts. Okay, So there is a throne in heaven in chapter five where everybody worships. And once that worship has uh, begun, that means the lamb takes charge of the scrolls and the scroll is opened. A scroll that was sealed during the time of Daniel's life, you know, during the time of the old book of Daniel in the Old Testament, a scroll was sealed. And this scroll contains the judgment for the world. And nobody was found worthy to open the seal. And the Lamb of God, who was crucified, comes and opens the seal. Once the seal is opened, judgment is unleashed on the world. Chapter 6 onwards, you see the scroll open. And one by one, the pre-tribulation, that is tribulation is seven years, extreme judgment for the world. And just before that itself, the judgment begins. Okay? So the pre-tribulation judgment begins. And uh, it is like uh, birth pains, the Bible says. You know, as a lady has birth pains. Birth, during the delivery time, she has the extreme pain. But before that, the pain is also there. And the earth goes through that groaning period, that uh, gestation period, where the pain is very, very severe. And that is the pre-tribulation judgment. And that takes about one whole chapter of chapter 6. And then there is a pause. A glorious, gracious pause where God allows 1,44,000 Jews and countless number of Gentiles to be saved. The gospel will spread suddenly and the majority of the people on earth will come face to face with the truth of the gospel. And God will save specific number, 1,44,000. That is actually considering the tribes, 12 tribes of Israel, 1,44,000 of Jews will be saved particularly. And uh, unknown number, that's a great number of people from all races, nations, languages, and backgrounds will be saved during that pause. That is God's grace in the middle of judgment. Now, these people are special people because they will not depart from earth without being martyred. There is no rapture for them. There is no taking out of this world for them. And their faith is going to be tested through and through for the next seven years. And God is going to keep them protected, but they are going to leave this earth as martyrs. Okay, So this is in chapter 7. And soon after that, the persecution is unleashed on the church. And the church goes through a lot of suffering. The Lord graciously protects the 1,44,000 Gentiles being martyred. A great number of people will be martyred for their faith. And that is happening in chapter 8 and 9. Now, when nine happens, um, the judgment on the world is unfolding one after the other. The judgments of the Lord does not affect the church, but the judgments uh, of the uh, Lord will start affecting the world. One by one, the people who don't believe in God will start suffering the judgment of God. Okay? Then, uh, after that, you see two witnesses in chapter 11. Two witnesses who will be raised up for God, who will proclaim what God has done and what God is planning in the coming future. And they will be witnesses seen all over the world. And the whole world, which is against the Lord, will be persecuting those two witnesses. They will do great wonders and signs and miracles. And suddenly, those two people will be put to death. Who does that? The beast. By then, the Antichrist is slowly rising up. He's surely uh, showing his true colors. And at that particular point of time, God gives the Antichrist the authority and the power to kill the two witnesses. And the whole world will witness that these two witnesses are dead and God will give them life again. Once they are dead, they will be given life again and they will be taken up to heaven. Okay? 
So showing that they are authorized from heaven and they are sent from heaven for this particular purpose. Once the two, two witnesses leave, judgment becomes more severe. We see chapter 12, chapter 13, chapter 14, the rise of the beast. The beast is the Antichrist and the Antichrist has been wounded on the cross, but now he comes in full power. Now, who is the Antichrist? We have no idea who the Antichrist is, but the Bible gives us a hint that he will be a political and a religious leader. He will incorporate both politics and religion into his lifestyle. And he will be a person who will be worshipped by the world as God, as the Messiah. Jews will also worship him as their Messiah. And he will come as though he is bringing peace to Jerusalem. After all these years of war and um, problems with all the neighbors, Israel will suddenly be at peace because of a peace treaty that this person, the Antichrist, brings. And there will be peace in the land. And at that time, they will hail this man as the Messiah. And this Messiah will now take control of the, even the worship in their temple. Now, the temple will be built at that time, and he will start worshipping in the temple as a priest. And that time, the Bible says he is the abomination that causes desolation in the most holy place. Okay, So he is the Antichrist. He is the personification, which means he's a person now, and uh, he's not the devil alone. The devil will give him all authority, and uh, that, that he has received from the Lord himself. And this man, one man, will take control and charge of uh, raising up an army to fight against the Lord. Okay, And this Antichrist, he will be supported by a person called the false prophet. And he's the man who will be showing signs and wonders to attract people towards the Antichrist. And he will attract a lot of people. In fact, the whole globe will be uh, deceived by these two people, the beast and the false prophet. Okay, So uh, this is the uh, this is the last, uh, sorry, uh, this is the 15th and 16th chapter. And uh, we also saw that the, all the uh, one by one, the judgment follows parallel with this. And in chapter 17, the great uh, Babylon, that has been the center of all this religious activity and the political activity will fall. The judgment will come upon the beast and it will start taking away his kingdom. One by one, it will take apart his kingdom. And we saw in chapter 17, the prelude to it, the beginning of it. Okay, and chapter 18 is actually the fall of Babylon, right? So far, this is where we have reached, and we are going to see the judgment that falls on uh, this Babylon. Both uh, the religious judgment and the political judgment is going to happen. All right, can anybody tell me which verse we stopped on last week? Those of you who were there last week. <coughs> Are we there? Yes. Uh, Ajit, can you tell me which chapter, which verse were we in, so that the others would know where we stopped last week? Uh, uh, we took uh, Revelation chapter uh, 17. Uh, actually, we discussed about yes. the, yeah, uh, where the cities were compared to like uh, those uh, criteria. Correct. Okay. Okay, so that was the prelude to the judgment on Babylon. Okay, thank you. Now, uh, chapter 18. Okay, chapter 18 starts uh, with the angel. It says verse 1 and 2. After this, I saw another angel coming down from heaven, having great authority, and the earth was made bright with his glory. And he called out with a mighty voice, Fallen, fallen is Babylon the great. She has become a dwelling place for demons a haunt for every unclean spirit, a haunt for every unclean bird, a, ha a haunt for every unclean and detestable beast. For all nations have drunk the wine of the passions of a sexual immorality, and the kings of the earth have committed immorality with her, and the merchants of the earth have grown rich from the power of her luxurious living. See, Babylon was not only an ancient city and a powerful empire, but it was a symbol of mankind's rebellion against God. You know, Babylon represents the world system of the beast, particularly the economic and the political side of our system. Okay? At the same time, John calls Babylon a city at least eight times in the book of Revelation. Okay? 
John is calling Babylon a, a city at least eight times. I will give you the reference. You can just jot down the reference. Okay? When you're writing down the references, write the numbers first. Revelation 14, 8. 14, verse 8. Next reference. 17, verse 18. 17, verse 18. Next reference. 18, verse 10. Okay. 18, chapter, verse 10. Next reference. Chapter 16, the full chapter 16, he refers to Babylon as a city. And uh, chapter 18 to 21. Okay. Chapter 16, the next reference is chapter 18 to 21. In all these chapters, Babylon is referred to as a city, as a city. Okay, So uh, all Old Testament prophecies also make it clear that the city itself will not be rebuilt. Okay, the, the structure that we call a city, like a metropolis, like New York or Bombay or something like that, we, it will not be rebuilt as a city. Okay. But they equate, um, you know, most people equate uh, Babylon with Rome. But Rome was a system, you know, which pervaded into the lives of people. It is the attitude of Rome that is highlighted as the rebellion. Okay, So which means the Bible calls her, uh, along with the, you know, uh, uh, the city, Bible also refers to her as a harlot or a prostitute, okay? which shows that religious prostitution, having, you know, claiming to uh, to love Jesus and actually serving another God is prostitution. Okay? Religious prostitution means uh, claiming to serve one husband, one God, and then straying away and following after other gods. Okay? That is what religious harlotry is all about. So here, when the word harlot is used, the, it could be a deceptive church, a church that seeks to take away the love towards Christ, towards some other gods, man's created gods. Okay, So uh, the harlot and the beast, this prostitute and the beast will cooperate. We saw in chapter 17, the beast will be uh, in supporting the harlot. And the harlot will become, you know, very much uh, glorious in that time. And people will start putting their faith in the harlot, trusting the harlot. And suddenly the beast will take over from the harlot. The harlot will be put aside and the beast will rise up. Okay. So uh, the, the attitude and the uh, religious worship of Rome, the false religion of Rome, is the attitude of the harlot. Okay, so it is not a particular place as such, not a city as such, but it's the attitude that will be prevailing. It will be conquering the thoughts of man. Okay, so uh, in, in John's words, when John was writing it, people would have thought that it is the Rome of those that era. You know, because the persecution actually came from Rome. False religion, uh, you know, of worshiping the kings came from Rome. All kinds of fake, uh, you know, gods and doctrines and all those things came from Rome. So it was the seat of religion and it was the seat of politics for a Jew of the first century. So they would have compared it to Rome. But we understand that um, uh, it is not just one city. It is a thought. It is an understanding and an attitude that will be prevalent during the times of judgment okay, or the tribulation. Okay, Right. So uh, in verses 1 to 3, you find condemnation. Okay? God is condemning the world. Okay? It says, uh, you know, uh, fallen, fallen. You know, twice it says ba Babylon has fallen. Now, this, despite all the plans that Satan makes, uh, uh, you know, Habakkuk chapter 2 verse 14 says, the earth shall be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord. You know, no um, devil can actually take away the glory that belongs to God. You might see, when you look around, you might see that uh, things seem as though devil is in control. Things seem like Babylon is taking up charge. But underneath the truth, underneath this fact, will the fact that Habakkuk says, the earth shall be filled with the knowledge of the glory of God, which means the control has not departed from God's hands. He is still in control, but he is allowing Satan to take a last minute effort on the hearts of men. Okay, so after all the pre-judgment, a pre-tribulation judgment, after all the judgment that began, even now the hearts of people were hardened. They never did repent and come back to the Lord. And because of that, 
the lord exposes the thoughts of man as uh, you know hardened hearts so um, we also find uh, uh, the the beast has uh, now started a religious movement and the idol of the beast is being worshiped beast uh, is being followed and the antichrist has taken over control of people's religious uh, uh, what do you call it uh, aff- affiliation you know so uh, this is the time when god's glory is going to be manifest so as believers we have reason to uh, uh, to trust that you know god is going to do his work and satan is already at work but at the same time god has been always at work and he will make sure that these things do not go out of hand okay so verse 1 to 3 uh, is uh, a pathetic uh, you know condemnation of this uh, new movement or the new religion and um, uh, as uh, this is going to happen the world system is opposing christ it has always been opposing christ and we must uh, be aware as children of god in this generation that there is a subtle influence in uh, of this devil and his schemes even in the way that we believe you know? in churches there will be false doctrines being taught people who are nominal christians will lean towards evil and wickedness and people who are believers will be more and more uh, challenged and persecuted in their faith so the world system satisfies the desires of the earth dwellers who follow the beast and reject the lamb okay i'll say it again the world system satisfies the desires of the earth dwellers who follow the beast and reject the lamb but worldly things are never permanent it does not satisfy it does not last the love of pleasure possession and position it is idolatry it is demonic in its origin and it is destructive okay the love of pleasure possession and position it is it is a form of idolatry it is demonic in origin and it is destructive okay so this is what was 1 to 3 teaches us babylon being the seat of unclean spirits unclean things it is detestable he says so judgment a condemnation is coming for babylon was four onwards you will find four to eight there is a voice of separation okay. then i heard another voice from heaven saying come out of her my people lest you take part in her sins lest you share in her plagues for her sins are heaped high as heaven and god has remembered her iniquities pay her back as she herself has paid back others and repay her double for her deeds mix a double she mixed as she glorified herself and lived in luxury so give her a life measure of torment and mourning since in her heart she says i sit as a queen i am no widow and mourning i shall never see for this reason her plagues will come in a single day death and mourning and famine and she will be burnt up with fire for mighty is the lord god who has judged her there is a voice of separation okay when you look throughout history god has been calling his nation israel to be separated from the world see we are not called to be isolated from the world but we are called to be separated from the world how is these two words different god has kept the church within the world and the world must not corrupt the church world must not get inside the church okay the church is kept inside the world but the world should not get inside the church worldly thoughts worldly forms of worship worldly thoughts and ideas about how to live the christian life must not permeate into the bubble that is called the church but the church is like salt it should mingle and mix with the world but the world cannot or should not enter the church okay, this has been god's call from old testament you would see when god called abraham he ordered him to get out of this country okay. genesis chapter 12 verse 1 god separated the jewish nation from egypt and warned israel not to go back to the egyptian way of living now today the church is commanded to separate itself from the ungodly okay now what are the two reasons john is giving two reasons for god's people to separate themselves from the diabolical devil system okay the first is that they should avoid pollution okay they should avoid pollution and become and should not become partakers of her sins see the church should separate itself from the 
system that is around them and it should avoid pollution okay the first reason is that it should avoid pollution which means no more partaking in her sins okay first timothy chapter 5 verse 22 says do not be partakers of other men's sins okay so the word means joint fellowship or partnership see there is a uh, we our partnership is only with the lord you know philippians chapter 4 verse 14 philippians chapter 4 verse 14 says there is a good partnership in the lord okay and there is also an evil partnership the bible says in chapter ephesians chapter 5 verse 11 ephesians chapter 5 verse 11 there is an evil partnership that we must avoid okay and true unity of the spirit you know it only exists among believers but we must not compromise by joining forces with that which christ is opposed to okay if christ is opposed to this worldly system then i have no right to form an alliance with it form an agreement with it to become in partnership with it okay so it says so that you may avoid pollution you should keep yourself separate the second reason is that god's people should be spared the plagues that he is going to send to babylon see god is going to send tremendous judgment on babylon at that time people of god who have been patiently enduring you know the growing sins that are around them they should not pollute themselves otherwise the judgment of god will be poured out even on them so uh, he would god is going to treat babylon as babylon treated his people okay how she persecuted uh, you know the the christians the believers the saints that is how babylon is going to be persecuted by the lord he is going to be judging them so at that time when god is crushing babylon we must have nothing to do with it so uh, you know this just as when israel was there in uh, egypt they were supposed to you know separate their rooms and houses by uh, you know uh, painting the blood of the lamb on the door post the angel of death would come upon egypt only so that was the desire of god and would keep the israelites safe but if they had not put the the blood covering on the door post it would cause tragedy for them also see so being separate means making sure that you would not be participant in their sins keeping yourself from pollution and secondly so that god might not judge you along with the way that he is judging the babylonians okay now what specific sins would god judge you know now we saw already that babylon has got an evil influence on the nations of the world he has been she has been seducing the world with idolatry so idolatry is the first sin that god is going to judge now but there is another big sin that soon follows it says babylon is going to be judged for its pride you know revelation chapter 18 verse 7 says as she glorified herself and lived in like she has glorified herself she saw herself as a queen who could not be you know dethroned who could who has a false confidence in herself you know and she is she will never accept the lord Okay, so Isaiah forty-seven gives you a lot of detail. Isaiah chapter forty-seven gives you a lot of detail about this attitude of pride. Okay, and she has glorified herself. She has a false confidence in herself. She will never accept the Lord. And this is the second sin that is going to be judged. Okay, so the first one is um, uh, seducing the Lord, uh, seducing the world with idolatry. Okay, so idolatry is going to be judged. second sin is going to be pride now when i say idolatry you know don't think that it is only idols who are worship no idolatry for a believer is anything that takes prominence away from the son of god anything that takes our heart away from jesus is idolatry okay so idolatry can also mean uh, anything that takes away my energy my time and my resources my energy my time and resources anything that takes away my energy time and resources away from jesus is an idolatry suppose i am addicted to um, to video games okay i am addicted to video games or mobile games or whatever game i am gaming takes a lot of my time okay the gaming takes a lot of my resources my money in is being spent on gaming you know i invest in the best hardware i invest in the best equipment i invest in um, you know joysticks and uh, Uh, and video cards and that and this and computers and anything gadgets i i aim for all these gadgets so that i can play and play and play more okay which means i am wasting my resources on that particular 
idle in my life. So I lose my money on it. I lose my resources on it. And I'm spending a lot of time and energy and myself into that game, into playing and being addicted to it. So if I'm spending my energy on it, my strength on it, I'm uh, spending my resources on it, and I'm spending my time on it, that is my idol. So anything that steals this three away from Jesus could be an idol. It could be a relationship. It could be a particular hobby in your life. You know, it, it may be a good hobby, but it could be taking away your time with God. Then it is a sinful idolatry. It could be a, it could be a person. You know, if you love that person more than you love Jesus Christ, you're giving all your resources to him, your energy to that person, to that relationship, then that person is your idol. People follow celebrities and superstars. They spend all their resources on gaining whatever that uh, superstar endorses. You know, people uh, could be, you know, following this um, sports stars. You know, all those things happen. So if that person is your idol, then he will take your focus away from Jesus. So uh, uh, the first sin that is judged is idolatry. Second sin that is judged is pride. You know, pride has this nasty way of coming up when I least expect it. When somebody gives me a compliment and says, hey, that was good. Immediately, pride starts rearing its head. And at that time, I had to be all the more cautious that I do not slip into pride. Why? Because this is the first sin that devil tempted Eve also with. You know? Thou shall be like God. And that very attitude, very thought of being like God, you know, it was there in the heart of Satan also. Bible says, before he fell, he wanted to be like God. The glorious creature that God had created wanted to be like the creator. See the pride of how beautiful that creature has been created. The pride of having all the talents and all the fame and all the fortune that God had created with. So the pride was one of the primary sins that caused the fall. So idolatry, pride is the first and second sin that are going to be judged. Thirdly, you find there is a third sin that is going to be judged, the judge, and that is the worship of pleasure and luxury. No, verse 7. So give uh, uh, her, so I lived in luxury, so give her a like measure of torment and mourning, since in her heart she says, I sit as queen, I'm no widow, and mourning I shall never seek. A worship of pleasure and luxury. To live you know, to enjoy the luxury uh, that others are not enjoying. Many don't have the privilege of all the things that we enjoy. But worshipping and seeking after it with everything that you have, that I want more pleasure. I want to try out everything. I want to see the world. You know, we, are, we are, see it reflected in the, uh, in the echoes of people. You know, there's no harm in seeing the world. But if that becomes your only priority of life and all your possession goes into it, your time goes into it, then it is a seeking of pleasure. Okay, So worship of pleasure and luxury. See, the most important thing is to be concerned about the needs of other people, especially the religious or spiritual needs of other people. You know, And if you ignore those things and you pursue after the pleasure and luxury that the world offers, it is, at, it is summarized as lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. 1 John chapter 2, verse 16 summarizes this. It says, uh, making you know, pleasure and luxury as the primary and the most important things in your life, you will fall into the lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. 1 John chapter 2, verse 16. So, John is warning that people, the church, the believers, even today, must not delay in separating themselves from this evil system. Why? Because God's judgment will come suddenly and Babylon will be destroyed in a single day. <coughs> God's uh, you know, judgment works very silently, but it surely works. You know, Sometimes it works. You know, The Bible says in the book of Hosea, Hosea chapter 5 verse 12 says, God's judgment works silently as a moth. You know how a moth is, you know, when it flies around. This is a rainy season now, and we see a lot of these moths coming into our house. And we won't know that the moth is there. It will just stick onto the wall, and it will be lying there. And when we go close, we'll see a discoloration on the wall. And if you touch the discoloration, it will be a moth. And Hosea chapter 5 verse 12 says, God's judgments work silently as a moth. Okay. And Hosea chapter 5 verse 14 says, sometimes God's judgments 
are as a lion. You know, what is the similarity between a lion and God's judgment? You know, a lion does not give a warning. It does not give, say that, you know, I'm a lion, I'm coming to get you. No, it suddenly springs out of nowhere. You know? The animal will be grazing its food and suddenly out of the grass, uh, a crouching lion will suddenly leap on uh, the unsuspecting victim. You know, So uh, sometimes God's judgment is like a moth. And sometimes Hosea chapter 5 verse 14 says, it is as a lion. It springs suddenly and there is no escape. One day the whole thing is going to collapse and those who are under it will suddenly feel the wrath of God. Okay? So an entire economic empire is what the Bible is saying, will collapse in a day. Okay? And those who have their citizenships in heaven, they should rejoice in the judgment of God. See? But those who are under the system, they will, uh, they will be suddenly caught, you know, as though a stone has been removed and all the small insects under the stone has suddenly seen the light, they will run for cover. They won't know what to do. They will panic. Why? Because they're coming under the judgment of God. But those who have their citizenship in heaven, those who are the children of God, they should rejoice at the judgment of God. Okay, so I'm going to go to the last passage that we can study for today. And that is uh, the next few verses. All right. Uh, I think uh, we can take maybe two more verses. And the kings of the earth who committed sexual immorality and lived in luxury with her will weep and wail over her when they see the smoke of her burning. They will stand far off in fear of her torment and say, Alas, alas, you great city, uh, you mighty city Babylon, for in a single hour your judgment has come. And the merchants of the earth weep and mourn for her since no one buys their cargo anymore. Cargo of, there is a list over here, Gold, silver, jewels, pearls, fine linen, purple cloth, silk, scarlet cloth, all kinds of scented wood, all kinds of articles of ivory, all kinds of articles of costly wood, bronze, iron and marble, cinnamon, spice, incense, myrrh, frankincense, wine, oil, fine flour, wheat, cattle and sheep, horses and chariots and slaves. That is human souls. All right. Now, what is the judgment here? This is a uh, verse. Uh, 9 to 19. It's a very long paragraph. Okay? It describes the mourning of the merchants as they see Babylon go down in smoke. Okay? All their wealth of the merchants is destroyed. The image that is given here by John's writing is a rich and prosperous ancient city where a lot of ships used to come and visit. The wealth of the city was providing for um, the you know, uh, for, uh, a salary for you know many 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 people employees many 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 nations were dependent on this and what happened uh, uh, the, the merchants are lamenting on the fall of Babylon see not only the merchants but chapter uh, you know 18 verse 9 says the kings of the earth see? business and government are so joined together that when one is affected the other also gets affected see? We all know about the, uh, you know, the, about the uh, merchants of uh, weapons. You know, nations are dependent on good weapons for their soldiers, for their army. And uh, uh, one nation is feared over the other when that nation exhibits the kind of armory that it has, you know, kind of weapons that it has. If I have, you know, AK-47 guns, when the country is showing its power, it would show forth all these weapons. So the other countries will get afraid of this country and they will not attack this country. They will not think about attacking this country. See? When a country boasts of, uh, you know, um, what do you call this, uh, missiles, uh, you know, it has, to, it has in possession all these atomic missiles and all those things, other countries will think twice about attacking that particular country. See? So the business of arms is very much, you know, linked with the prosperity of a nation, security of a nation. So the governments are dependent on that, even though you know, dealing of arms is illegal, government does it. Why? Because governments who do it, who deal with it or pay money and get these arms, they are more secure. See? So the government, the politics, the economic growth of a government and the business is quite intertwined or linked to each other. Okay? So um, you know, the city of Rome in those days, in John's days, was the center of trade and government. Okay. It is known for luxury and extravagance. You know, People keep spending and keep living a life of ease and comfort. 
politically and economically the people of the those uh, that age that era is dependent on rome okay now today the connection is very much complex between government and business computer systems have taken over it is no longer uh, you know uh, required that one city should collapse if one network collapses babylon will collapse you get what i'm saying so it has become high tech now and we don't have you know this itself uh, the, uh, even the global connectivity is something so that if one nation suffers networkly you know on the network all other nations would also suffer so, so uh, 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 what is given here is a loud lamentation or a wail chapter 9 uh, chapter 18 verse 9 says a loud wail which means it is not a silent weeping it is a you know like how people uh, beat their chest and and wail out when somebody dies when you go for a funeral you see people crying like that you know so it is as though somebody has died in verse uh, 11 it says there will be weeping so nations are not feeling sorry for the city nations are not feeling that oh poor uh, you know babylon no they are feeling sorry for themselves because they have lost their business they have lost their valuable customers see god has brought an end to their life of luxury and wealth and that is why the employees are weeping okay verse 17 to 18 uh, actually shows you for in a single hour all this wealth has been laid waste all ship masters and seafaring men sailors and all those who trade all whose trade is on the sea stood far off and cried out as they saw the smoke of her burning okay so Uh, that life of luxury and wealth is over and that is why they are weeping okay they are not sad to see the city go but they are sad to see their lifestyle ended okay and god uh, john is giving an inventory of all the commodities that were brought that brought wealth to these people you know that brought wealth and riches to the kings the merchants the ship masters gold silver precious stones that's the top of the list okay then costly garments is there in chapter verse 16 alas alas for the great city that was clothed in fine linen in purple and scarlet adorned with gold with jewels and with pearls see and items made of different different materials like uh, verse 12 is wood is there you know and uh, those days you know during the roman time they used to make a uh, decorative uh, wooden stuff like uh, almara and cabinets and you know chairs and tables which are luxurious furnishings okay and spices were imported uh, it was exported and imported and all kinds of food and uh, costly things were used like perfumes also so perfumes are very 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 costly stuff you would find uh, nard you know it takes one whole year's wages to get perfume like nard which is broken on the head of jesus you know actually the bottle was not broken the perfume was broken and the contents of it was poured on the head of jesus and the person who saw it judged in his heart what a capital waste see so extreme costly perfumes were also used by rome they had to depend on uh, you know all kinds of imports so that the life in rome could sustain the luxuries you know and uh, imagine uh, when this um, lockdown happened and all these sad things happened when trucks don't come into our state or district from across the border people inside the city will starve we could see that when some daily necessity things would not come from across the border when trains don't work when trucks don't bring it you don't get fresh produce of uh, uh, of uh, vegetables and meat and all those things and our great cities would starve if these things are cut off so, so when business collapses okay, the verse 13 says the most disturbing thing slaves and souls of men okay now during that time of john's writing one third of roman population was consisting of slaves okay almost 10000 human beings were auctioned off in one day in a slave market of rome okay so which uh, puts an estimate like 60 million slaves throughout the roman empire people who were treated like furniture bought and sold used and abused you know this was the condition of the slaves during that time okay so john is suggesting that there will be an end to it okay 
pressure to slavery no that is not what john is actually predicting here but see those who are working as slaves also means that you know you are in offices you are in uh, posh buildings but you are still slaves okay so in the ancient sense the slavery is not going to come back but people are bought and sold even traded you know if you look at uh, athletic teams or uh, uh, football teams in in europe you would find uh, you know people are traded you know they are, they have to leave one club and join another one and uh, our corporations are funding them they are sponsoring so all this buying and selling of people are happening okay workers are being traded up and down they are being traded to other nations to their other branches you know uh, for other companies so all those things will happen why right? but people have become more enslaved to luxury they have more bills to pay you know they can't break loose from the system and because of that the system seeks to control the lives of the people with, who are officers and workers see so if you if you just extend your thought about you know universal enslavement you will understand during the time of the beast the whole world would be subject to the system of trading people okay. so uh, you know in uh, revelation chapter 13 verse 16 to 17 shows you a glimpse of what happens when the mark of the beast is put on the people the beast will require all people who follow the system to receive the mark and trading buying or selling is only possible for those people who have received the mark of the beast see and he also demands that all people who have received the mark should worship the image of his of the beast of himself which means he will promise freedom but he will put men and women in bondage no he will take advantage of people's uh, hunger you know chapter uh, 18 verse 14 says the fruit of which your soul longed has gone from you all your delicacies and your splendors are lost you never to be found again see we have a hunger for these things and the devil will take advantage of that second peter chapter 2 verse 19 says that he will put men and women in bondage he will promise freedom but he will put each of us in and slavement see now if you compare it with the old testament you will find a number of parallels to this particular thought ezekiel chapter 27 is an example you can read it in your own free time ezekiel chapter 27 says there is a cry over the fall of tyre okay fall of tyre tyre is a big city how it fell and what it cost the people who are living in tyre and dependent on tyre you will find all that in ezekiel chapter 27 see so this parallel is there in many parts of the bible and is repeated in the book of revelation chapter 18 the devil the beast who promises freedom but puts men and women in enslavement see look at your own life and i look at my own life what are the things that i thought would bring me freedom but i am trapped under right now i thought this would give me more freedom i thought it would give me more free time i thought it would give me more access to other people and their their uh, relationship but now since i had that thing in my life it has taken away my freedom it has taken me a slave it has made me a slave to the system check our lives this bondage is what we are talking about now verse 20 to 24 and we will end this chapter verse 20 to 24 is a contrast to the lament okay there is a rejoicing of heaven's inhabitants the merchants and the kings are lamenting the fall of babylon but the people of god are rejoicing as inhabitants of the kingdom of heaven now how important it is the god's people should look at the events from god's perspective okay and we are commanded to rejoice at the overthrow of babylon why because the judgment of god it will actually be a repayment for the servants of god who are martyred so revelation chapter 6 verse 9 to 11 gives you a detail of the martyrs and those servants who are martyred they cry out to the lord and say when lord how long do we have to wait for our blood to be avenged so the people of god should rejoice why because what has been given to babylon is god's justice towards the martyrs who have shed their blood on behalf of Christ. Okay, so 
not the repeat of the use. No more. No more. Okay. Why? Because Jeremiah used the same approach when, when he warned Judah of the coming judgment at the hand of Babylonians. Okay. No more. No more. Jeremiah chapter 25, you'll verse, verses 8 to 10, you will find this warning that Jeremiah gives. Okay. So now that judgment has come to Babylon, the, uh, the uh, Babylon's laws indicate that you know but luxury and necessity will be removed, music and manufacturing will be removed, work and weddings they will come to an end. See, so not only uh, you know luxuries like uh, you know food and things like that or homes and even music, okay? even music and all kinds of uh, entertainment and weddings, all these things will come to an end. Now. Verse 24 uh, must be compared with chapter 17, verse 6. Okay. Revelation chapter 18, verse 24 must be compared with Revelation chapter 17, verse 6. And Matthew chapter 23, verse 35, the judgment that Jesus prophesies. Okay? Now, Satan has used the religion and business to particul uh, particularly you know, persecute God's people. During the first half of tribulation, I told you, the beast rises to power. What power? Both uh, political and as a religious leader, he will come to power. He will work together in opposing the children of God. Uh, and um, how does he do it? By joining with the harlot, the great city, Babylon. Now, God is patient with his enemies, but when he does his work, he acts suddenly and thoroughly, within a day, within an hour, the Bible says, see. So, it is not for, you know, the uh, Bible is not calling for, uh, you know, the uh, believers to rejoice when sinners are judged. No. Actually, it breaks our hearts. You know, when, when we see among the sinners, we see our friends, our relatives, people who are condemned to eternal punishment. Maybe even some of us who are listening to this message, okay, you might find those people there suffering judgment of God. But the joy does not come in seeing their suffering. The joy comes on the righteous judgment of God. Seeing that justice has been done. Whoever has been you know, treated um, you know, by the world unkindly, their blood has been avenged by a righteous judgment of God. In that, we are called to find our rejoicing. Okay? So, uh, you know, it is, it is very, very, very easy for us to discuss these things in our Bible study you know, as students of the Word of God. It is very comfortable for us to sit in our home and uh, study all these passages. But if you and I were there uh, with John on Patmos, okay, and we'll be seeing the suffering saints to whom John had written all this passage, okay, we would have a totally different perspective. See? This is not personal revenge that God is advocating. This is not a joy in seeing, oh, those fellows who are not among us, they are suffering, you know. That kind of a prejudice, kind of, uh, you know, narrow-minded thinking is not what uh, the Revelation is highlighting. No. We are rejoicing at the righteous judgment of God alone, okay. So, we are glorifying that aspect of God and saying, Lord, you, ju you judge fairly. You judge according to your rights. And there can be no excuse for any man to stand against you, okay. So, this is the joy of the people as they watch judgment in action. Okay, So, <clears throat> uh, at this point, the political and economic system of the beast has been destroyed. Okay, All that remains is for Jesus Christ to come back from heaven and personally meet and defeat the beast and his armies. Okay? This he is going to do, and then the righteous kingdom on earth is going to be established in chapter 20. Okay? But before that, we have to go to chapter 19. Okay? Next week, we'll go to chapter 19, and we'll find out, uh, before we go into chapter 19, today the question that we have to ask ourselves is, are we citizens of Babylon? Or are we citizens of heaven? Can you rejoice because your name is written as heaven? Do you have the confidence, the assuredness that your name is written in the book of heaven? If not, the time has come for us to trust in Jesus Christ and get out of Babylon and into the family of God. Time does not wait for anyone. Once the judgment starts, once this move of God begins, there is no going back. Okay. 
So ask yourself the most important question today. Are we citizens of Babylon or are we citizens of heaven? If you are a citizen of Babylon, it is time to get out of Babylon and come into the family of God. Okay, we will stop here and we will pray. Let us look to our hearts and identify where we stand. <clears throat> Glorious and heavenly Father, we want to thank you because you are a God who has warned us. Time and time again, you have warned us. And there is going to come a time when, like Jeremiah said, no more. Like how John the Apostle says, no more. And the judgment of God is going to fall on all Babylon. The political, religious, economic system that we see around the world is going to be judged by the living God. And help us to understand this morning this one fact of where we stand. Are we with Babylon or are we on the side of the family of God? Are we on kingdom of God's side or are we on the side of Babylon? Father, if our idolatry, if our sin involves pride, and if our focus and worship is on the luxuries and the pleasures that the world has to offer, I have to be warned this morning that I am on the side of Babylon. If the whole world economy collapses, Lord, would I be grieving over my loss of lifestyle, my possessions, my property, or would I be rejoicing on God's righteous judgment? That would set me in the right place. Father, help me to judge myself before I judge the world. Help me to judge my perspectives, my motives before I judge others. Help me to check whether I am on God's side or not before I leave this class. I give you all glory and praise. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.